chapter 17. Also Matthew in chapter 17 tonight. Good to see you here. Don't forget, we have handouts uh, for the lessons, and then we have the handouts for the kids. Good to have the kids with us, and, uh, and so we have kids, uh, the ones for the 12 and under. Once the service has started, and all the kids 12 and under have the handouts, teens and adults, you're welcome to have the hand, the coloring sheets, and the word searches, all right, if you, uh, if you find that helpful. And, uh, but let's let the kids have them first. Matthew chapter 17, the last uh, three verses of that uh, chapter, Matthew chapter 17, we're in the series, The Miracles of the Master. They've been a great encouragement to me. I hope they've been a blessing to you. Amen. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 17, the Bible saw, uh, picks up this in verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received the tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And he saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him. That means he spoke before Peter spoke. What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, of Strangers. And Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Now notice with this very intriguing verse in the Bible. Look at that next word, notwithstanding. In verse 26, Jesus establishes, says, listen, really, I, there's no really real reason I need to pay this. But he says this, notwithstanding. Lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast in a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. Wow. That's a good day fishing. Amen. If you've ever gone fishing and caught a nice fish, that's a good day fishing. You catch a fish and it's got a piece of money in its mouth. Man, now that's a really good day fishing right there. This is a wonderful miracle of the master, and there's so much here in this passage. We're going to unpack it tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time to be in your house, to be, Lord, amongst God's people, dear Lord. Uh, Lord, there's no place I'd rather be, Father, just to sing in your wonderful praise, and God fellowshipping with the saints of God. It's a little slice of heaven right here on earth. So, Lord, we want to just tell you we love you, we thank you, we praise you tonight. Father, thank you for this wonderful story, this wonderful event in, in the, your earthly life and ministry of your son. God, help us, Lord, to extract every bit of nutrition out of it tonight spiritually, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Let's jump right into this tonight. First section, of course, is back to Capernaum. If you study through the Bible, one of the reasons why you study through the Bible is because if you just read through the Bible, if you just read through, many times you just casually pass over. But when you take time to pause and study, you start to see things will pop out at you, trends patterns, different things. And one of the things that I hope that you found is to see just how much God has to say about this little town of Capernaum, just how often Jesus was there. Notice with me in your notes, much of Jesus's ministry was based out of the city of Capernaum and centered around the region of Galilee. You notice in your notes there, try to put that same map back in there so you can see the different towns and the different cities that Jesus crisscrossed the Sea of Galilee as he was there fulfilling his earthly ministry. Now, we learned uh, many weeks ago that Capernaum was the, was the capital or was the headquarters of his earthly ministry. This is where he lived and this is where he continually came back to. So what did that mean? It means this, Jesus would have been a very prominent and closely observed, closely observed member of the community. Remember, Jesus was shaking everything up. People were wondering, who is this guy? Is this John the Baptist? Is this Elijah? Is this Jeremiah? Is this some other prophet? And so because Jesus was healing the dead and ra uh, 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 healing the sick and raising the dead, and teaching and preaching, he was attracting a great deal of attention and scrutiny. And so this question comes up by these people who were in the city of Capernaum, who were the uh, collectors of this particular money. We're just going to find out what kind of money this was, very specific kind of money, and, uh, or specific, very specific kind of tax. And so they were watching him. And they were wondering about him. And so Jesus would have been a very closely observed member of the community. Now a question arose concerning Jesus paying his temple tax. His temple tax. You say a temple tax. Man, preacher, I'm glad we don't have that in the New Testament. No, we don't. Uh, we give our tithes and our gifts and our offerings. And that goes to support God's work. But they had something in addition to their tithes. In addition to their gifts. In addition to their offerings. There was a specific amount of money that was prescribed. For the men and the head of the families to give to help support 
the work of God. And so the people that were in Capernaum were like, huh, I wonder if Jesus is doing that. Now, rather than going to Jesus uh, directly, the temple tax collectors asked Peter if Jesus paid his expected temple tax. To which Peter said, notice in your uh, text here, look with me in verse 24, in verse 25, and he saith, what did he say? He said, say it with me, yes. He said yes, all right. Peter got it right. Now, then Peter was on his way to see Jesus. Now, I want to uh, make a note here. So this kind of sets up where we are. We are in Capernaum. We know what's going on. A question has arisen by the, uh, the folks that were responsible for gathering the money that upkept. That it, it repaid for the stone and the mason and the repairs and all the different things of the house of God. And so the question came up and said, this Jesus, this rabbi, does he pay his temple tax? Let me give you a, 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 a good truth here. Listen, people are watching you. People are watching you. A famous preacher many, many years ago by the name of D.L. Moody said this. He said, one Christian will read the Bible and 99 people will read that Christian. That's a true statement. Mr. D.L. Moody ministered in downtown Chicago over uh, 100, 150 years ago. And Mr. D.L. Moody uh, living in that, uh, listen, Chicago is bad now and Chicago was bad then. And listen, uh, the fact of the matter is there was a lot of godless people. And Mr. Moody knew this. Listen, the world is watching. You know your neighbors are watching you? And if you drive out of your driveway on Sunday morning, you drive out of your driveway on Sunday night, you drive out of your driveway on Wednesday night, and uh, clearly you're dressed, you're going to church. And they see this pattern. They see you going. They see you coming. Listen, your neighbors are watching you. Your co-workers. If you work, your co-workers are watching you. It's come up that you go to church. It comes up that you're a Christian, that you know the Lord. For you students in your school, listen, uh, it, 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 it can be, it should be noticeable. You're, you should be known in your school as a Christian. Uh, too many Christian uh, young people, whether it's in high school or middle school or college, listen, it's like they're in the Christian Witness Relocation Program. They're just undercover, all right? They're hoping to just get along. But listen, God's people ought to stand out. And understand, listen, the people who know that you're a Christian, they are watching you. You know what they're watching you for? They want to see if it's real. They want to say, if this Jesus that you say that you love, do you really love him? This Bible that you say you believe, do you really believe the Bible you say you believe? The things that God says in the Bible, do you really believe the things that God says in the Bible? Listen, the world is watching you. You, they're watching me. You don't know why? They want to know if this thing's real. They want to know if there's anything real to this. Because let me tell you something. The world has found, listen, what they're going after, what they're getting involved in, leaves them very unsatisfied. How many of you guys know anybody that's very unsatisfied in the world tonight? You know somebody that's out in the world. Listen, they've tried the sex. They've tried the drugs. They've tried the fame. They've tried the success. They've tried to climb the corporate ladder. They have everything of possession and position uh, that would say that would fill them. And they still find themselves empty. And they're desperately wondering, is what you have real? The world is watching. Now, number two, I want to point this out here. Notice with me the second section, the tax man. The tax man noticed. Matthew, or here's the next word you want to write in, Matthew or Levi. Levi, as he is known or notated in the scriptures, as he is called elsewhere, was a publican. He was a publican. So the next word you want to write in your notes tonight is publican or a tax collector. Now he was a tax collector for the uh, occupying Roman government. So two different things going on here. The people that were asking Peter were not the Roman government. These were people, officials designated from the temple. They were put in charge in every major city to have a census and have a list and find out and check your name off. Listen, uh, it, uh, paying the taxes is no new thing. Uh, aren't you all glad for those of us who live in the city of Holland? By the way, public service announcement, taxes, property taxes are due next Wednesday. All right? So if you haven't paid your Holland property taxes, they're due next Wednesday. So make sure you get on that. But listen, uh, they're keeping track. Down at City Hall, they keep track. And these people kept track. And they were wondering. They were looking down the roster and they didn't see Jesus had paid his temple tax. And so Levi, uh, of, of all the uh, gospel writers, what, what were the gospel writers? Let's say them with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, exactly. Of all the gospel writers, interesting. Notice in your notes here, he alone was led of the Lord to include this interesting event in the life of the Lord in his gospel. You will not find this account in Mark. You will not find this account in Luke. 
And you will not find this account in the Gospel of John. So it's interesting. The only place that you'll find this passage in your entire Bible, in the life of the Lord, is right here in Matthew's Gospel. You know why? Because Matthew was a publican. Matthew was involved in tax collecting. This was intriguing to him. This was interesting to him. It's an interesting insight on how God works. Let me give you a truth here. God often uses the individual, the individual uniqueness. Here's the next word, giftings. God often uses our individual uniqueness, comma, giftings and experiences, how? For our good and his glory. God uses you. God has a plan for you. And God uses you differently than he uses me. And God will allow you to connect with people and interact with people and have ministry opportunities, listen, that are different than me. You know why? Because God shines through you differently. He uses your unique gifts, your callings. He uses your uh, uh, um, experiences. Why? He uses them for our good and they uses, he uses them for his glory. So it's interesting, this, uh, this particular event was recorded by Levi. This is when I, I'm just going to point out a few interesting miraculous events that are in here. I didn't put them in your notes, but I, you know what I see in here? I see, I see the miraculous event of preservation. All right, we're going to get to the big miracle. We're going to get to the big miracle. But if you if you want to just make a few side notes tonight, as I was meditating on this lesson this afternoon, and I was thinking about all the different things that happened, you know, it was a miracle. It really was a miracle of God that God spoke to Matthew or Levi, and God inspired him to write this little three verses and include it in the Bible. That's a miracle of preservation. Now, what was the temple tax? So let's answer the question. Well, what was what, what was going on here? All right, now lose the next section here. I actually gave you a picture here. All right, those are some actual uh, first century coins uh, that they uh, have a picture of, the, the, the obverse and the reverse there. And, and this would have been what they would have used uh, as far as paying the temple tax. Now, when the Lord directed Israel to build a tabernacle, the next word you want to write down in your notes is a tabernacle. When the Lord directed Israel to build a tabernacle, when they come out of Egypt and they were in the, at Mount Sinai, uh, uh, for, to build the tabernacle for, for them to meet with him in the book of Exodus. He also included in Exodus chapter 30 and verses 11 through 16 a means for its systematic upkeep. Next word you want to write in there is upkeep. Listen, God knew that buildings, and particularly at that time, tents, they were out. Listen, eventually the curtains were going to get thin. Eventually, the, listen, they would take that thing apart and put it back together and take it apart and put it back together, take it apart and put it, and they would carry it around. They carried it around in the wilderness for 40 years. That thing was going to wear out. And so God planned for its systematic upkeep. How did he do that? Well, he did that by, through this means. At, at the time of every census, if you were to read Exodus chapter 30 and verses 11 through 16, you find that every time they took a census, and the Bible doesn't prescribe how often they would do that, uh, which is the counting of the people. You say, Pastor, what's a census? Some people, uh, some of our young folks say, what's a census? A census is where they go around and they count everybody. Every 10 years in America, America does a census. And they go around and go eeny, meeny, jelly, beanie. And they count everybody uh, that's alive at that particular time and figure out who's who and who's where and how many people. And they use that for all kinds of different things. But God says, every time you count everybody, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take every man over the age of 20. Every man over the age of 20, they figured uh, the uh, estimation is by the time you were 20 in that society, you had accomplished your formal training, you had received your skilled training, you were most likely in an arranged marriage, and you had started your own household. And see, so he was the, talking about the head of a household here. And so at the age of 20, he was required to pay a half a shekel. Let me spell that for you. S-H-E-K-E-L, a shekel. Half a a shekel money to the Lord for the maintenance of the tabernacle. So this is what's going on here, all right? So every male over the age of 20 was expected to pay a half a shekel every year for the maintenance of the tabernacle. And later, after this, so later, okay, so that was in Exodus. Now, you guys remember what happened? They were, the children of Israel were in the land. They were in there for long years, and they established the kingdom. You had King Saul, and then King David, and King Solomon, and then King Rehoboam, and then King Rehoboam, the kingdom split, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And then both countries fell away from God, and both countries went into captivity. 
Northern country of Israel went into Assyrian captivity. Southern kingdom of Israel, uh, Judah uh, went into Babylonian captivity. They were gone for 70 years. Israel never came back as a corporate nation. God, after 70 years, God brought the people of uh, uh, Judah back. He brought them back as a people. Now, and, and so then you get into the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. All right, It's called post-exile. Also the last three books of your Old Testament. Zechariah, Malachi, uh, um, um, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, notice with me in your notes. Later, after the return of the people of Judah from the Babylonian exile. How many of you guys glad I didn't make you spell Babylonian? Raise your hand. All right. After the Babylonian exile, Nehemiah, a man by the name of Nehemiah, spell it however you want, you can find it in your Bible, reinstituted the offering for the upkeep of the temple. You can read about it in that in Nehemiah in chapter 10 and verse 32. But he went light on the people. He said, instead of a half a shekel, just do a third of a shekel. It was tough times. Now, in Jesus' day, the money would have been equivalent to what the Bible calls two pennies all right if you read in your bible and you'll read in the, specifically in the new testament you'll read that word penny now that was a translated word that word was uh the underlying word would have been the roman denarius all right the roman denarius we've talked about that oftentimes each roman denarius was worth the common man's average day's wage so if you work five days a week you would earn five denarius during your week so it was a significant amount of money and so the half a shekel was worth two of them, so the value of two days' pay for the common labor. So every year in Israel, every man over the age of 20 was expected to do his part to, uh, uh, to help maintenance the house of God and to give their half a shekel. Half a shekel was the two denarius, and so that money would have gone to the upkeep of the temple, all right? Now, everybody knew Jesus was a religious man. Jesus, everybody knew that Jesus loved the Father and glorified God. And so the question came up, is Jesus doing his part? So let me pause here and make a devotional application for us. All right? That's a good question, church. When God looks at us and we look at each other and the question is asked, hey, am I doing my part? Am I doing my part? Am I doing what I can do for the house of God? For the work of God and for the glory of God. Now listen, I can't answer that question for you. I can only answer that question for me and my wife in our house. But that's something that you ought to ask yourself as you look around. It's interesting. Is the, the, the God calls, God compares the church to a body. All right? If you have a body, say amen. 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 Good. I'm glad no one is a disembodied spirit here tonight. All right? And uh, that would be kind of awkward. We'd still count you for the attendance. But anyway, the... Uh, but listen, you expect, when you get up in the morning and you go to work every day, how many of you expect all of your body that can to participate? Raise your hand, all right? You go up, you expect your, hand, your right hand to work, and you expect your left hand to work, and you expect your right leg to work, and your left leg to work. Now, how many of you have found some parts that don't work as well as they used to, all right? The wrists, the knees, the elbows, oh, the back, all right? And you can tell, you can tell when pieces, parts of the body don't want to work, right? It's aggravating, it's frustrating, it's hindering. You say, Pastor, what's wrong with America? Pastor, what's, why aren't we reaching the world? I'll tell you why, because the body of Christ isn't all contributing. The body of Christ is not, listen, the Bible says that in the book of Ephesians that the body makes increase of itself by that which every joint supply. Every part of the body is supposed to work together and listen, and do its job can I just ask you this for Jesus are you doing your job for Jesus are you doing your part that's a great question that only you can answer now notice with me here this wonderful wonderful answer no we get back into our text tonight we're in Matthew chapter 17 and so notice with me Jesus uh, Peter gets posed this question he now heads back to Jesus in verse in verse 25 um, and he saith yes and when he was come into the house Jesus prevented him now I just pause here if you know anything about Peter this is a miracle all right Jesus talked before Peter that's a miracle all right right there because if you know anything about Peter Peter was always talking all right and usually it wasn't good all right Peter had the problem of open mouth insert foot and so that Peter suffered a lot from foot and mouth disease and so Peter though it's interesting before Peter could open his mouth Jesus the Bible says prevented him it's interesting this is you know, a miracle. This is a miracle of preeminence. All right. Thank God 
thank God Jesus, listen, thank God Jesus is, bed, is, is more powerful than our weirdness, our wackiness, and our weakness. Amen? Can anybody say amen right there? Jesus is more powerful. Jesus is more powerful. Listen, that applies to some of you more than others. But anyway, it's a miracle. You know it's a miracle that God can use us. Do you ever think about that? You think God in heaven, his plan, his plan to reach the world is you. I wouldn't have chose that plan. <laughs> his plan is me. I wouldn't have chose that plan. I know me. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you're thinking. But you know what happens when God uses me and God uses you? And you know what happens when God uses us? He gets the preeminence. He gets the glory. Amen. I think that's another miraculous thing in this passage. Notice with me as we continue to read verse 20. Jesus says, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or strangers? Peter saith unto him, of strangers. It's a miracle. Peter got two things right in this passage, all right? That's like uh, amazing for Peter. He got two things right. But Jesus says, then are the children free. And then he says in verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. And then he finishes, go thou to the sea. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue a pause or reading there. Notice with me in the next section, free to do right. This is a wonderful principle that Jesus brings out here. Now, on this earth, was Jesus obligated to do anything, yes or no? Other than, uh, other than to obey his father, his father in heaven, all right? Was Jesus greater than anyone on earth, yes or no? I'll answer it that way. Yes, he was, all right? Was Jesus greater than the government, yes or no? Was Jesus greater than the temple, yes or no? Was Jesus greater than all, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, okay. So Jesus, quite frankly, had the liberty to do whatever Jesus wanted to do. So what did Jesus do with that liberty? What did he do with that freedom? What did he do with that? Notice with me in your notes here. Before, Jesus, before Peter could bring the situation to Jesus, uh, he, as the Bible puts it, prevented him. You'll notice that same term in the book of Thessalonians, that they which are a, 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 a dead in Christ shall not, or they, we which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. To go before, that's what that Bible word means. It means to go before. Or he spoke before Peter could and asked him a question. Who do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute from their children or, uh, their children or people or from others? The answer was others, of course. The next thing you want to write down is the word others. The answer was others, of course. Now Jesus is both God and God's son. If you believe that, say amen. 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 All right. He was God by his deity. He was God's son by his incarnation. And as a son, the son of God, he should not have been required to pay the temple tax for his father's house. That explains what Jesus is trying to say there. That was his father's house. Jesus goes on to say that even though he was technically free, he was willing to do the right and expected thing so as not to cause an offense with others. My friend, you need to mark that down. Jesus is example of liberty. Jesus is example of using his freedom. He used it to serve others and to be an example. And by, here is a great principle of the Christian life. We are free in Christ. I want you to just underline this next phrase. To do the right by God and others. Underline that. We're free in Christ. Yes, we are. We're free to do right by God and right by others. Interesting, I gave you two uh, references there. Galatians 5.13 and 1 Corinthians 9.9. 9. Let me read them to you. In Galatians 5.13, the Bible says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, that is freedom. Only news not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. God says, yes, you have freedom in Christ. But you, have the, you know what you have the freedom from? You have the freedom from sin and the freedom from self and the freedom to do right by God and to do right by others. That's the greatest freedom that you can do. Let me read you 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Paul says, under the inspiration of God, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Listen, friend, God did not give you and I liberty in Christ so that we can go out, I'm going to do my own thing. Don't tell me what to do, preacher. I'm going to do my own thing, all right? That is not why God gave us liberty in Christ and freedom in Christ. God gave us the liberty in Christ, number one, to be free from the bondage of sin and Satan. Can anybody say amen right there? 
all right? But you know what he also gave us liberty from? The freedom from self and selfish desires to do right by God and to do right by others. Now, let's look at the last verse. Let's, let's get now into the heart of the passage here. Notice with me in verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast in a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and the interesting here not only did jesus pay his taxes he paid peter's taxes all right how many guys would like somebody else to pay your taxes this year amen praise god if you were looking forward an opportunity to serve the lord just let me know after the service now the lord provides notice with me in your notes the lord demonstrate his complete mastery in two areas number one in both knowledge and Nature. The Lord Jesus demonstrates and displays his complete mastery of knowledge and nature in directing Peter to go to the Sea of Galilee, cast in a fishing line, and that he would catch a fish with a coin lodged in its mouth. Now, I see a couple things here. I see miraculously, if you want to write this off inside, the, the miracle of providence. The miracle of God's providence. Now, I don't know how that coin got in that, that fish's mouth, but most likely somebody dropped it. Have you ever dropped something in a lake and you couldn't find it? That's a frustrating feeling. All right. Now, I don't know whether Jesus tossed it out of his pocket. Jesus walked on those waters a lot. Jesus was on those waters quite a bit. But somehow, that coin got in the water. All right. Now, is money usually in the water, yes or no? No. All right. And so it wasn't there just naturally. Somebody put it there, all right? Somebody it got there one way or another, all right? And number two, that fish scooped it up for one reason or another. But I see on marvelous display the providence of God. Jesus directs Peter. Listen, he didn't tell him where to go. He didn't tell him where to fish. He said, go get your fishing pole and, uh, and an angle, which is a fishing hook. And he says, you go. And listen, Jesus sent Peter in his providence to the right place at the right time to throw in the right hook to get the right fish to get the right thing done. You know what's on display there? The Lord's marvelous providence. You know what you can do? You can trust him. You say, Pastor, what does that mean to me? What does that say to me, pastors? Listen, you know what you can do? You can trust God. Amen. You can trust. Listen, the Lord has it under control. That's his marvelous providence on display. Also, if you want to put in here, his provision. You can make a note here. What else do we see miraculous here? Well, I think the big one that stands out, the one that's like plain on the page, is provision. All right? The Lord, the, the miracle of provision. Now, back with me to your notes. Now, this was not just any coin, by the way. This was the exact coin needed to pay both Jesus' and Peter's taxes. This was the full shekel, all right? Each man was required to pay how much? A half a shekel. And so this would have been one coin. This would have been a full shekel. This would have been four days' wages, four-fifths of your paycheck this week. How many guys would like to find that coin? Amen? That would be a good fish to catch right there, all right? So not only was it a fish, but it was the right fish with the right coin at the right time. That's a miracle. Oftentimes, now listen, there's a great truth. Oftentimes we limit the Lord by expecting him to accomplish his will through our expected means. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and, and, and you needed something and you're like, Lord, I need this and, and you had an idea. You know, you know, Grandma, it's getting close to my birthday and I bet your grandma's going to send me a birthday check. Amen. I, you know, I got this need and I know it's coming up, but, but this is how, I, I, I bet you I know how the Lord's going to do this. And then the Lord does it. How many of you guys have ever had that experience? <laughs> Quite a bit. Amen. Now listen, sometimes I believe we limit the Lord. We're so busy, we think the, we think the answer is going to come through this door right here. God doesn't always send it through the door that we expect. I guarantee you, Peter was a fisherman. Peter had been on them waters all of his life since he was a little boy. Peter caught a lot of fish. I would venture to say, you can ask him when you get to heaven. Peter, I got to ask you, how many fish did you ever catch with a shekel in its mouth? All right. I got a feeling the numbers are pretty low. All right. Peter, how many times did you go down and you threw in a hook 
And the very first fish you caught, all right, now it's just a miracle you catch a fish on the first cast, all right. And you catch it, and that fish had exactly what you needed exactly then. I got a, I got a feeling the, the statistical probability of that is pretty small, all right. Listen, friend, you got a free dinner too, amen. I forgot about it, you got the fish too. Can I just say, let's not limit God. Let's not limit God by expecting or putting God in a box and say, God, this is how I'm looking for you to answer my prayer. Because I guarantee you God has a much greater opportunity than that. Now let's close this up here. We think we know how God will answer our prayers or meet our needs. Listen, God is not limited to how he works. He can truly do anything. Now just a summary here. It must have been sweetly satisfying for Peter to return to the tax collector's office with coin in hand to pay not only Jesus' taxes, but his too. It's a testimony to two things, to the Lord's goodness. It's a testimony to the Lord's goodness and a testimony to the Lord's provision. I get to see Peter uh, just whistling. I can't whistle, sorry. If somebody can whistle, whistle. All right, just Peter just walking down the street. He's got this shekel in his hand, walks up to the counter. Hey, boys. Tosses it on the counter. Mark, me and Jesus paid. That would have been a sweet day. That would have been a sweet day for Peter. You know what that was? Is those men that sat behind that counter. Those men that received the custom. You know what? You know what that was? It was a testimony. It was a testimony. Remember what we said at the very beginning? People are watching. People are watching. Listen, friend. If you and I will allow God... God will use us to be a conduit by which he demonstrates his goodness and grace. Allow God to use your life. Allow God to use you to be that instrument of witness and testimony. Hey, listen, God is good and God provides. And he's such a wonderful God. I think that's one of the marvelous, most marvelous miracles of Jesus' ministry. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you, Lord, for this passage, Lord. We, Lord, we clearly see the, the miracle of the fish and the coin, Lord, but this whole passage is just, it's just full of the miraculous presence of God. This is just one little event in the spectacular life of Jesus. Lord, thank you, Lord, from every verse and every passage, Lord, it's just, it's just dripping Father, with your glory and your power and your majesty, God, your wisdom, and God, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that we would see in this passage tonight, God, God, you know, you know our needs, God, you know what we're facing, God, you know the situation, you know the circumstances of our life, God, you knew the situation before Peter even got back to the house, God, you have well things well in hand, Lord, help us to rest in you. God, I pray as we, we go through this series and we see the mighty power of God and the, the goodness and the provision of God, I pray, dear Lord, that we would learn to trust you. And Lord, we would learn to rely upon you. And Lord, we would learn, Father, to rest in you. You're such a good God. And God, you're always on time. And Lord, you're always faithful. And so, Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that we would just, with all of our hearts, just commit ourselves to your trust and care. And so, Lord, we thank you tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. If we stand tonight, as we stand for a time of invitation this evening as the musicians begin.